This is a, a talk that I, it, it has a long story because I mean, we started working on that in uh, 2016, I think so, in a TOLO meeting. Then we, we made the first presentation at Tackle, but then in the end, I mean, we, we went on uh, working on distance. So, I mean, in, in the end, the final, very final version of the paper only appeared this year, at the beginning of, uh, of 20, 2021 in Indagaciones Mathematiche. And so, it, it, well, I mean, uh, there's been, uh, we have worked a lot on that, but uh, very, very um, occasionally, because I mean, we had very few occasions to, to meet and so on. But anyway, I mean, so the, the story is about uh, nuclear implicative semilattices. So let me talk about, I mean, in the first part of the talk, I will review some uh, more or less standard stuff because I mean, it's usually that one has to review something. And uh, so, uh, so we'll start for, with uh, the definition of implicative semilattice. This is very, quite simple because they correspond to the implication and conjunction fragment of, um, uh, of implicitistic logic. So you have a, a semilattice with a, which is a <coughs> commutative monoid, and you have a, a, the, the conjunction as a resituation, so there is an implication, and this is the usual uh, axiomatization. Of course, there is <coughs> an axiomatization with, um, uh, equational axiomatization, with, uh, which is quite uh, standard to get from, from this. But anyway, let me recall. It's important because in this way, implicative femilatis is from a variety. And so, uh, and here you have the equations. I mean, uh, these are uh, at importance, commutativity, associativity, unit element, and then the, the condition corresponding to the adjointness. Uh, the fact that the implication are, are, is a right adjoint conjunction. Uh, then, of course, you can de define the order as, as, it, as it's usual in semilattices with uh, A less or equal to B is the same as A and B equal to A. Then the important point is that this variety is locally finite, meaning that any finitely generated implicative semilattice is actually finite. This is Diego theorem, which was proved in a um, uh, algebraic way method in an algebraic way. We'll see another proof during this talk. And uh, um, I mean, of course, I mean, this is a remarkable property. It's true for Boolean algebra, but it's absolutely not true for heightened algebras. And the cardinalities of this finitely generated free Brouwerian semilattices or implicative semilattices are two names for the same things. And the cardinality are growing very, very uh, rapidly. Because as you know, I mean, this is how the, the numbers. I mean, with three elements already is something unbelievable. <laughs> yes. and, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and so there is no, no way to, to really compute uh, the elements of, uh, but it still is finite. So this is quite curious fact. I mean, that's, uh, and it's very, very interesting that, that it is finite. So uh, now, I mean, uh, a finite uh, implicative semilattice is complete because it's finite, so it's complete, so, so it is a lattice. It is also distributive because, I mean, uh, uh, since the, the conjunction is, to, is a left adjoint, then it preserves a right uh, a limit uh, join, uh, joints, and so it is distributive. Because, because of the existence of the adjoints, it's automatically distributive. Therefore, I mean, uh, the, for the point of view of the object, the category of finite Brouwerian semilattices is the same as the category of, of finite heighting algebras. However, the morph and also of distributive lattices, but the morphism are different. And it's important to, to, uh, to realize this. I mean, for a certain point, it will, it will be important to realize this. So we expect that there is a duality between uh, this finite Bavarian semi-lattice and finite process. Okay? And uh, in fact, I mean, this is, was uh, settled by Kohler in uh, 1991. There is another duality by Guram and other people, but I mean, we are using this. I mean, at a certain point, we, 
we discussed whether to use the other dualities for our result, but in the end, we, we stayed with the, with the standard color duality. And uh, it's a little bit strange in a sense, because I mean, uh, well, I mean, the objects are the finite posets, but the morph for the morphism, we take partial marks. So that's, that's the, the interesting point. Uh, the, the fact, a fact that which is quite uh, peculiar for this structure, usually it, it doesn't happen in, in the semantics of non-classical logic that, that the morphies are, are partial mass. But here they are partial mass, and this is an important point that, the, that one has to be very careful in, in, the, in the computation for that. In addition, I mean, you have a, a order, they are order preserving, but strictly order preserving. Meaning that if A is less than B, then the image are less, are still less. So you cannot collapse two elements which are one less the, than the other. Okay, this is another uh, specific fact. And then you have also for this strict order, you also have the usual uh, p-morphins condition, meaning that if P is in the, dom the domain of F, and if C is some Q over it, then there exists a p-prime such that P, P prime is, is bigger than P and F of P prime is equal to P. So this is the standard result by Kohler. And uh, well, I mean, we need a little bit to understand how the duality works. I mean, I will give you only the definition of one, well, the duality is given by two functors, okay, a joint and so on and so on. But what if each one of the two determines the other one and actually it's sufficient to know one. Okay, and for, for the purpose of this talk, I mean, it's, I will give you only the, the description of the, of the fact that matters. So to any finite poset, we associate the implicative similarities of the upsets given by, by the up to the closed subset. So you, you take the subsets such that if they contain an element, they contain also all the elements which are bigger. The meat is intersection, top is the top. And the implication is given by, I mean, this is the usual characterization of implication in intuitionistic logic. I mean, it is written in a concise way, but I mean, it's the standard one. Okay, but we have to be careful with, about uh, uh, the, um, the, 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 how the functor works for maps. Because if I have a partial maps, the associated morphism of implicative uh, semilattice is given by this formula. I call this F star of B, but it is not precisely the inverse image. So this is the formula, the, 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 the formula in well, synthetic formula. But what the formula means is the following is that, I mean, it, it's the same. I mean, this, this, this line here, this line here is the same as this one. But let's unravel it. It says that for every x in P, x is this is in this uh, f star of B. If all elements above it, which are in the, in the domain of F, are such that the image is in B. Okay. So we have to keep in mind this because it will have some uh, meaning in future. I will have to come back to this point at certain point because I mean this is interesting to you. And uh, now, I mean, this is, can be checked that uh, the quotient of the implicative uh, semilattice is correspond to total and injective morphism. And embedding corresponds to subjective morphism, which may mean not total. Okay? So this is in interesting. I mean, the embeddings correspond to subjective morphism, as expected, but they subjective, possibly not total. Okay, so all this is quite, in a sense, uh, standard background. I think that uh, everybody in the audience know this because of... Then let's start considering nuclear implicative semilattices. So what is a nucleus? Uh, it can be defined for, for um, semilattice, just for, for semilattices. There is no need for implication to give the definition. And it's a unary operation which satisfies the following condition. So uh, every element is less than J of this element. J is idempotent and commutes with conjunction. 
a nuclear implicative semilattice is an implicative semilattice which has a, uh, this operation. Okay, so the aim of, of this talk is to prove the Diego theorem for this uh, enrichment of implicative semilattice where you have this uh, operator here. As you know, it is a little bit strange because from a certain point of view, he has some properties of the box because I mean, this is a, a property of a model operator of box like, but this will resemble more the, the operator that a possibility operator should have. Okay. And in fact, I mean, the nuclei are interesting only on an intuitionistic basis because on, on the on a uh, Boolean basis, they are not very interesting. I mean, they are not inconsistent, but they are not they are just joined with, a, with an element. Now, uh, here you have the original, uh, the, I mean, I don't think that most of you already know, know what, or already saw this definition, but for people, who, for few people who not, do not know, I mean, I can take the origin of all this. I mean, the origins of nuclei come from, uh, say, algebraic geometry, so to say. I mean, if you, if you take a shift and we see it as a, a, a shift of, of a topological space, we can see it as a contravariant functor from the poor set of the opens with a contravariant functor to set with uh, some uh, properties, unique gluing properties. And for this, you, if we take sub pre shifts, meaning that for every open, I take a subset of, uh, of a shift, I can define over, over this uh, subplane sheaf, a, a, a nucleus, and it's a typical example of a nucleus. I say that an element which belongs to, uh, which lives at the level of the open alpha, belongs to the, to the, to the J of a subplane sheaf, if and only if, then take this element, restrict it over to some opens contained into A, and take all this restriction. Well, take the restriction where the, uh, the restricted element belongs to S. And then they, they should, be, should be a cover of alpha, meaning that taking the union, you, you will have your alpha. So this is a kind of a modality because it says that JS contains the elements which locally belongs to S, belong to S in a, in a, a longer cover. It's a kind of a geometric modality, so to say. I mean, then what is the history of this? I mean, then Grotendieck generalized uh, this definition of cover using a, a general abstract uh, notion of a cover, the so-called Grotendieck topology, and introduces topologies as sheaves on sites, meaning on categories, equipped with this topology. But this topology is just a generalized notion of a cover. Okay, then uh, when Lovell introduced the, the elementary topologies, he also um, pointed out that this uh, uh, nuclei, which was called local operators, can be seen as intuitionistic modalities. And in an elementary topos, the nuclei on the subobject classifier correspond to localization and sub topology. So they are very important uh, uh, things. But by themselves, they are nothing but uh, intuitionistic modalities. Then in the context of uh, propositional logic, there are, uh, it was studied by a couple of papers by Bozzi and Meloni in uh, 1977, and they established it complicit uh, and finite model property, and then by Goldblatt. And also, I mean, I, it was also my first, very first subject where, I mean, I wrote a part of my master thesis, not the PhD thesis, my master thesis in, uh, under the supervision of Meloni, and it was about uh, some, so the different ways you can, uh, you can in, uh, pr prove completeness for, for, this, uh, for this propositional law, intuitionistic logic and that would relax operator. Nothing very special in this paper, but I mean, this is what for me, it's, uh, it's, kind of, it's, it's reminded of my very young uh, days. Then uh, the funny thing is that, that Mendler and Mendler in 1992, one, they rediscovered nuclei in the context of Stanford computer science application and they claimed that uh, they could be used for, uh, soft, uh, for uh, hardware verification. And they call this logic, uh, intuitionistic logic with uh, local operator, they call it lax logic. So this is one of the way this logic is, is uh, known today. 
Okay. Then I want to, to mention a, an application to intermediate logic, which is uh, which I had together with Gulam uh, just um, in 2017. Maybe it's not so not so known, but it showed that local operators are important also for intermediate logics. <clears throat> I mean, the, the application is the following. So if you take a nucleus on the, say, a heightened algebra, you take the fixed point of the J, so the element such that J of A is equal to A, and this comes to be a sub-implicative similitis of A, and it is also a heightened algebra. It is a, it's a complete heightened algebra. If uh, you start with a complete heightened algebra, you get a complete heightened algebra. But what is important is that this AJ is not a sub heightening algebra because the joins are not, are not preserved because the join in this algebra is J applied to the join in, in, in the original algebra. So, I mean, this is this age is sub J is a sub algebra, but not a sub heightening algebra. So this means that if you take a variety of heightening algebras, it doesn't happen that if they contain so the variety contain A, it may not be contain, contain A sub J. It contains A sub J if the variety is, a, is a axiomatized using only conjunction and implication, because these operators are, are, uh, are um, preserved, okay? And this trivial observation can be in fact inverted, because I mean, if we, if we call a variety of heightening algebra nuclear, if for every algebra you have that if A in the variety, then this AJ is also in the variety. Then, I mean, uh, this is the theorem, is that this, the a nuclear variety are exactly subframe varieties. So subframe varieties can be defined in many ways. One of the way to define it is that they are preserved under localizations. So this shows you that, I mean, this study of the J operator can be new, meaningful also for, for, for in non-classical logic, apart from the fact that it has a geometric interpretation, but it is usable also in this context. Uh, well, may I ask at this point, is it the same as axiomatizable by implicative axioms only? Is it the uh, same? Yes, I think so, yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm, yes. yes, yes, because I mean, you, you can, you can uh, um, yeah, but anyway, I mean, you, you can unravel the, the axiom and, uh, and uh, eliminate the conjunction, yes. yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Then, I mean, this is a, a kind of a example of a nuclei which you can uh, build by syntactic definition. It's like a, a catalog. I mean, in the theory of local, you can show that uh, all nuclei can be obtained as combination of these. You have uh, the look at, well, this is the, the most trivial one. If you fix an element, it, it take A of or X, and this is a nucleus. You can take A implies X, also fixing A. Or this is more interesting, maybe. X implies A implies A is also a nucleus if you fix A by the properties of uh, implication or uh, implication is uh, May I ask a possibly simple question? The definition of a nuclei uh, resembles very much the definition of a closure operator. Can you clarify the relationship between these two notions? No, I mean, it's, it's not the same because, I mean, if you see, I mean, uh, it preserves the, the conjunction. So it looks like an interior from this point of view. So it's a mix, it, it's something um, hybrid. You cannot, uh, look at it uh, from the point of view of topology, unless you, you, you consider the notion of a cover. That's the right way to, to understand this. But it's, uh, if, if, you, if you consider it from the point of view of, of modern logic, it's, it's something very hybrid. You see, it, it, it commutes with conjunctions. Yes, the first two properties resemble diamond, uh, while, uh, while the, the last resembles box. Yes, this is why it's strange. But that's what happens in the lax logic. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> but it makes sense over an intuitionistic basis. Over a classical basis, it's a little bit trivial. It's not so interesting. Okay, thank you. Okay, but yes, I mean, uh, the first time you see such things, you try always to to make connection with uh, other things, but you have to consider that this is a, 
uh, a standalone uh, operator. I mean, it has to be interpreted by itself. Now, I mean, this is the first, uh, first theorem. I mean, uh, I think that it was proved uh, already in the very old paper by Bortz and Meloni, there was this result, I think in the very first one. I mean, so meaning that the, the variety of neutral implicative similarities is finitely approximable. So it's generated by its finite members, okay? So if you look at our paper in, in, in Indagaciones, there is a quite quick way to prove this because you take a, uh, an algebra which uh, where a term and a term and an algebra which does for, for in which falsify the equation that the term is different than one. You take some, uh, some, uh, some a finite subalgebra, including the interpretation of all subterms, and you can manage to make it uh, an implicative similarities nuclear by preserving all the operation which are uh, which correspond to subterms. I mean, uh, that's that's more or less the strategy. Uh, you have a similar strategy to prove a finite model property for intuitionistic logic, and you can uh, adapt to the, use the same strategy here. Too. I mean, or I think that Botts and Meloni use a filtration. So, I mean, you, you can use many different things. I mean, uh, uh, but am I understanding it correctly that it, this is a consequence of local finiteness, of course? Yes, of but, course. But, but local finiteness is stronger, much stronger than yes, the, yes, this. Yes, of course. But now we, what we want to prove is to prove fi uh, local finiteness. Then this is also a consequence. But one way to prove that it is locally finite is to rely on finite duality. So you have to prove this first. I mean, I mean, okay. And, and uh, because I mean, and, and use the fact that finite um, models are sufficient to generate the whole variety. This is a fact that it is used in the proof of local finiteness. I mean, this is the point. I mean, yeah. Okay. So, uh, and, uh, and another important thing is that how to extend the finite duality, okay? Of course, I mean, we don't know at this moment that, finite, that uh, finitely generated nuclear similarities is uh, all finite. We don't know now, we'll prove it. And so, but we use as a, a technical tool, the, the, the finite duality, okay? But at the moment, we only know that the finite uh, model and finite, um, Algebras generate the whole variety. This is the, the only thing that we know at the moment. So let's try to extend the finite, um, the finite duality. So what is a finite nuclear, nuclear implicative similarity is isomorphic to a similarity of this form. You take the upset of a poset and you take uh, um, a finite subframe, okay? Not a generated subframe, a subset, so to say. It's a subframe, not a subset. And the operator J is given in the following way. I mean, this is the, as, as usual, this is the, uh, the formula, the, the synthetic formula. And this is what it means. It means that X is in J of D, if and only if every point below it, which is in S, is in D. So this is a picture that I have. Well, I'm not very good in writing down pictures because I did by when I wrote by hand, but I mean, this gives you the idea. If you, if you, if you consider the red point as the subframe and you take a, an upset D and you say that X is in JD if all red points which are above X are in D, okay? So this is somewhat reminiscent of the uh, notion of a cover, so to say. Because you may see that the red points are a kind of cover of X, okay? Of course, you can give also different semantics for, for this, um, for this uh, J. Uh, you can take a Grothendieck covering as semantics. This is what I, I did in my master thesis uh, in 1982. Uh, you, can, you, you can introduce a, a relation in a model style or whatever. But here, I mean, I think that this is the most simple way to get to get the, the semantics and then you have a duality theorem for finite frames. And so this is the one which is the more manageable, the, the most manageable one. I don't think that it is the most meaningful one. But you see, it's like in, a, in the case of topology. I mean, you can use a topological space to make the semantics of S4. 
But then you, you, triple frame are more simple. When you have to build the universal model, you will use basically use triple frames, not not the topology, because I mean uh, they are more uh, more simple semantics. And although I mean it is less informative maybe, but for 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 the purposes of propositional logic, this is sufficient. Okay. Now we call this an X process, S process. And now again, we want to uh, extend this to a full finite duality. And so we want to uh, consider uh, the, so what are the maps between uh, two upsets endowed with a J, okay? And so we, we want, we extend the curly duality. So you will have this partial map and they have to satisfy two conditions. You, you, you make kind of, this is correspondence theory, so to say, you make kind of, simple computation and you will get the following two conditions. So, so in the term S poset, the letter S is not the, the uh, name of that subset S. This is just a first no, letter yeah. of an English word. Yes, yes. Uh, I mean, uh, yes, maybe it's not very good to call it S poset because it's, it's confused with this S. So this is yes. called E and this is called S, but uh, all, both are S poset. I mean, uh, yes, uh, you're right. I mean, maybe that it could be muted to a calligraphic S, so, so to say. But okay, I mean, we, we get it. I mean, this is but the full term. An S poset is a poset and now we with a subset. subset. Mm -hmm. A subset poset. Yes, a subset, not not uh, not an upset, a subset. Okay. Now. Uh, so this can be turned into a nuclear semilattice using J related to S. And this one also can be uh, turned into a, a, a nuclear semilattice using the, the S given by this T. And they want to, to, to know what, it, what it, uh, happens that this map, the dual of this map, which is a color morphism, uh, when a color morphism is such that its dual is also preserving the J. This is the point. And this is done by if and only if uh, it satisfies the following two conditions. The first thing is that, I mean, if you take uh, the inverse image of this, it, it should be uh, equal to the intersection of the inverse image of this, should be equal to the intersection of S with the domain of the function. And you have a second condition, and it says the following, if I take something, in S, this S may not be in the domain, but if it says some points in the domain, which might not be in S, then there should be something uh, which has the same image as D and, and the, the, the path say from S to D prime should intersect some point which is in S and in D. So this is the, the picture. So you have, I mean, this shadow line is the domain of S. Then we start with an S, well, which is in a, uh, which is a red point. So it's, in a, it's a selected point. It see some point which is may not be selected, but which is not, which is in the image. If S is not in the image, then there should be another point which goes to the same point by applying F. And along this path here, you should intersect a point which is both red, meaning in the selected uh, subframe, and in the domain of F. Okay? If you see in this way, it's not that bad condition, so to say. Okay? Now uh, you have this theorem, which is, says that the category of finite nuclear implicative semilatices is dual to the category of finite S poset and S morphism. Okay. Now, uh, I want to use this uh, finite duality to, uh, to prove the, uh, the, uh, the extension of Diego, Diego theorem by using a universal model construction. Now, what is the universal model construction? Well, I think that here in the audience, there are people that work at on universal model for since a long time. I mean, I think that Valentin, maybe you were the first one who introduced universal models. I know that you had a paper in Nocladi in uh, 
70s? Uh, well, uh, the first person was Leo Isaki, of course. Leo Isaki, uh, yeah. okay. Yes, <laughs> yes. I, I but must... I mean, there, there were people in, the, in the East uh, Europe that they use it, that they worked on that. And uh, later on, also some people in my country, Fabio Bellissima in the 80s uh, worked on that, but just about 10 years later on. Okay, so we want to get the, the, the same construction here. Now, uh, what I want to, my approach to the universal model, I mean, it will be a bit uh, uh, peculiar because I, uh, I want to introduce my view of, of, uh, of this. This comes from a paper of mine in, uh, uh, 92, I think it was published in, uh, in the proceedings of a logical locking, although I didn't speak in that logical locking about that. So I think that I never gave a talk on that, probably. And I mean, it's kind of an abstract way to introduce a universal model. And I think uh, I use some uh, hypothesis. I mean, all these hypotheses are strictly not needed. But they are needed if you want to, to get some good properties of the universal model, okay? So let's forget about uh, the moment, I mean, up to a certain point about implicate similarities, but you take a variety over a finite signature, which is finitely approximable, meaning that it's generated by finite member. It has a reductive to implicative similarities, like you can have many, manner, many other operators. And also, this is an important property there must be a term such that if you take an algebra, two elements, y1 and y2, and you take the minimal, uh, you take the min and another element x, you take the minimal congruence generated by uh, x equivalent to top, okay? Then y1 and y2 are in this minimal congruence if and only if these terms interpreted in the algebra over x is less or equal than the benification. Okay, so I mean, um, this is not true for k, but it's true for k4, for s4, for our um, local um, nuclear semilatices, uh, nuclear implicative semilatices, and so on and so on, okay? So with these properties, uh, the, the construction works and has the expected properties. With less properties, it works. I mean, basically, whenever you have this, only this hypothesis, you will can you can manage to build the universe to build a universal model. But I mean, it won't have the good properties that you want to have. So you take a finite set and you take the finitely generated free algebra over this set. Okay. Now our ultimate game will be to want, we wanted to discover whether whether this is when this is finite to have a sufficient criterion for this to be finite okay now uh, i will call uh, take a finite i call a finite model a morphism from this algebra g is a finite set of three generators from the three generators of uh, over g and a finite algebra Okay, this I call a model. I mean, it's, it's the same as a model. I mean, in the algebraic semantics, but the algebraic semantics, since this is finite, this algebra here is finite. I mean, uh, well, they are frames in the, in the standard sense. So then, then I will call uh, the model irreducible if alpha is subjective. Okay, now uh, there is a, 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 another characterization because you see, Subjective is a, is a, a fact that in, in strictly speaking, in a purely categorical sex um, world doesn't make anything because subjective means something about the elements. So if you don't have elements in a categorical setting, you don't know what it means. So there are many different ways. One of the possible way of, of saying, and they are not all equivalent. One of the possible way to say that a map is subjective you can say that it doesn't, it cannot be factored, meaning that, so in this case, you can, this is um, irreducible, if and only if, whenever you take a factorization like that, if this is a monomorphism, then this is an isomorphism, okay? In, the other, in this context, it is completely equivalent, but this notion is a categorical notion, so it can be dualized, that's important. Well, I, I want to say, I mean, uh, I, 
I, in the end, I mean, the construction that I'm presenting here is equivalent to the one that we have in, the, in our paper in Indagaciones. But I will present in a different way, but it's a completely equivalent. But, it, but in the end, it must be equivalent because uh, it, it's identified up to isomorphism, so cannot be different. But the way I want to get it, it's a little bit different. Then, so to keep in mind this, okay? Then I would consider the category of irreducible finite models. The morphisms are commutative triangles where the arrows, the, the object are these uh, uh, irreducible models, and uh, the morphisms are the triangles, okay? The, the, the map that makes this commute, okay? Then you have a forgetful functor which associated to this object here, it associated the codomain to this map. Uh, uh, the map itself, okay? And then, I mean, you can, uh, you can make the inverse, this is a diagram in the categorical sense, and you can take the limit over this function, okay? And uh, I will call a universal model this limit, okay? Or for this finite set of generators. I mean, it, it, we'll see that it's exactly the same as the usual one. But I mean, uh, what we, it more important for us is that this is an embedding. Okay, and this is quite obvious because I mean, we have finite model property. With the other properties, meaning these other properties here, you can prove more. And this is in my paper. You can prove that uh, uh, existing joints and means are preserved. And also, I mean, since this is a, a, a finite limit, I mean, it's, a, it's a, in, in terms of frames, there is an inductive limit of finite frame. So this is also, uh, the, well, I mean, uh, the set of the power set of the upsets of, of a set of points, so to say. And using the abstract property, what you can prove is that the joint irreducible elements, the atoms in the classical case of this, they are all in the image. I mean, for this, you need th these properties because I mean, for K, it's not true that if you do this, this construction that uh, all points are in the limit. But whenever you have these properties here, okay, then you can prove that all points of this uh, of the dual of this space are in the in, uh, in the in the image, okay, and this is what characterizes universal moment. Uh, it can also prove uh, that there are universal properties of this construction and so on and so on. But I mean, this is, doesn't matter for for us. I mean, if you are interested, I can send you the, this old paper. I still have some copies. And, this paper. Mm -hmm. Now, what's important for us is that since this is a super algebra of this, if this is finite, then this is finite also. Actually, since I mean you have this uh, the definability property of points, they will be isomorphic. Okay. Now, what what is the strategy to show that this is finite? Well, I mean, it, you, the strategy is to prove that there are only finitely many irreducible models up to isomorphism. Okay, this is quite obvious. And the idea is to generate irreducible model layer by layer. But the point is that how can we recognize that the model is irreducible? Because irreducible, in a sense, if you take the, the official definition, means subjective. But project to, and this is the way usually people do. I mean, they, they define uh, for every point, they find a formula which describes the points and be careful in, uh, in uh, building this irreducible model in such a way that there are no repetition, no, no points that can be, that can be um, um, mapped one to, to another, identified and so on and so on, because they, can, can, they are uniquely characterized by a formula. But I don't want to build the formula. I don't, I only want to use this property here. Only use this property here. And the, do, and the finite duality. And how to do this? The idea is simple. Now, suppose that we have a finite duality theorem like uh, for finite uh, algebras. And we have, because I mean, uh, uh, if you keep in mind, my, the, my fir the first time of my first part of my talk, I just spent a lot of time to find this finite duality. So in, in our case, I mean, the finite algebra is the, the upset of a finite poset. 
In classical logic, it will be the power set. Okay. So now let's play, play with the definition. So a map from this to this by the universal property of free algebras is just a map in set theoretical sense from G to the, to the, to the upset. And then if you use the, I mean, this is the elementary topos axiom, I mean, basically, this is bijectively and naturally correspond to coloring map. So from map from P to, uh, well, the upset of the power set of G or the power set of G in the classical case, we, when in cases where this is simply a, simply a set. So this is the same as this. You have a bijective correspondence. Now you see that, I mean, since uh, you, you, we know that these are this kind of guys, have, they have duals, and we know the duality theorems of uh, free algebras, we, we can ask ourselves what it means that such kind of triangle commutes, right? And you have to, you, we can compute this. Now, uh, well, I mean, of course, I mean, uh, so there will be conditions which says that this commutes if and only if something happens here, okay? We have a map here, a map here, and this is the dual of this map. So we want to compute a, con a necessary and sufficient condition, which says that this commutes if and only if this has this property, which in, this, in the trivial case, it will be that that triangle commute, but it is not always like that. It is not always like that. Because you remember that in, in our case, since we have, we have color maps, these are partial maps. And so it won't be so simple. It will be a little bit different, okay? Once we have, we know what means that this triangle commutes if and only if this has certain condition, then what we can uh, uh, investigate what is the dual of a monomorphism and we can dualize this condition. If a model is irreducible, if and only if whenever uh, you have a the dual of a monomorphism like that, this must be uh, uh, an so, Well, this is this is uh, irreducible if and only if whenever you have a triangle like that. Well, this is the dual of a monomorphism that must be an, an isomorphism. So this is perfectly equivalent. So I mean, uh, it's by very general properties. I mean, and now. But we, it, we cannot do more than that at the level, at the abstract level. This is very, very general. Let's see what happens in our case, okay? This is what happens in our case. Case of implicative semilatis. This is the case of the original uh, Diego morphism. Now, I mean, the fact when the dual of this commutes, it is not when you have this. Because now it's time to come back to to a very old formula, which says that the dual of a map is given by this formula here, right? So the computation should be done keeping in mind this formula, okay? Then it's, uh, it, it's an easy exercise to do. I mean, in the end. I mean, and it says the following, not that, not that the triangle commutes with the relations, but that the, for every point here, the coloring of this point is equal to the intersection of the coloring of the elements above it, which are in the, in the, in the image, okay? Good, this is the condition for the, for the triangle to commute. Usually, well, I mean, in, in intuitionistic logic, classical logic, and in standard uh, logics, I mean, it is the commutativity, so it's much more simple. But here the story is different. And also we can, we have to consider that this map is a partial map. So usually in order to reduce a model, you identify two points. This is for intuitionistic logic, for class, for S4, for, for many logics like that. But here you can reduce the model also by taking out the point because the, 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 the dual of, of a, of, a, of an injective map is a subjective map, but which is still a partial map. So you have two ways for throwing out the point. One is to identify two points which are in the sense isomorphic. And the other one is to throw out a point. You, you are allowed to throw out a point to, depending on this condition. And so now we can have the, 
the, the condition for, for a model to be reduced, irreducible. Well, a model can be reduced. So it is irreducible when it cannot be reduced. It can be reducible. Well, of course, I mean, when I, you have to, well, I mean, I call NABLA of X, the set of immediate successor of, the, of X. And the coloring of nab, NABLA of X is the intersection of the colorings of the elements of X. So if you have two elements, which has the same color and such that they have the same uh, successor, then these two points can be identified. That's also in intuitionistic logic, in modern logic, this is a standard model. However, a model can be reduced even if you take a point whose color is the same as the color of the, of the immediate successor or the intersection of the colors of the immediate successor. This point can be thrown out. So if we want to build layer by layer, we are in the case of implicative similarities now, now not yet in the case of nuclear. Okay. So this is the, the crucial point. What can we do? You can generate a reducible model layer by layer. At the level zero, you take the singleton. The color of the singleton should be strictly contained into the set of into, into G because I mean, Otherwise, I mean, this intersection could be empty, okay? So if a, if a point has no successor, the intersection of the empty set is the total set, which is G, and it cannot have the same color as the intersection. So, this, this, so the coloring should be included, strictly included, because otherwise you can throw out the point. And at level N plus one, you pick an anti-chain intersecting level N, and we append to it a bottom point but you must color this new point with a subset of the coloring of the antichain. Now it's evident that since every, one, every time you, you add a point, you decrease the coloring, this cannot go on forever. And this is actually, you will step how, how many points you are in, uh, in G, how many levels you are in G. That's, that's it. So it's evident, this, this proves Diego theorem. This is another proof of Diego theorem. But now we want to, to, to get the same for the nuclear implicative similarities. And now, uh, now well, I mean, uh, remember the definition of morphism, how, huh? yes? I mean, the definition of morphism was given by this picture, this ugly, handy, uh, written by hand picture. I mean, uh, Where is it? Yes, it's here. Okay, so remember that this is was the definition of, of a map. Okay, the, the dual of a monomorphism is still subjective and partial map, but it must be, we must uh, satisfy this property. So if you go from a point in the selected subset and you see some point in the domain, you have to, you must go through a path, through a point which is selected and in the domain. Okay. So this is the point. So, uh, so then what, what you, you, it can happen now? When we attach a bottom point to an anti-chain, we must specify whether this point belongs or not to the specified subframe, right? Because this is the only new thing that we have to do. When, when you, you, we produce a new point, we have to specify whether it is, in the, which is, whether it is red whether it is in the, in, the, in the subframe, okay? And now, uh, okay, it may happen that a point has the same color of the points in the anti-chain. But in this case, there must be some point, some immediate successor, which is not red. Basically, I mean, this is the picture. This point cannot be thrown out because if you take the partial map, which is the identity and simply for, uh, has this uh, is not in the domain, then I mean, what may happen is that, I mean, in the original set, you see this, this is in the domain, which is in, in, in immediate successor, and it is not in S. So there should be something in the middle, which is red. But if you have eliminated this, there is nothing red. But in this situation, you can eliminate X 
Because, I mean, whatever it happens, the path through the elements in the domain, in, in, in the domain, uh, I mean, they are, they are always, you have, you, you have a covering here by red points. So you, if you throw out this, nothing happens, okay? So this is, so you can remove a point whenever it has the same color as the set of, uh, of the intersection of, of the, of the, of the immediate successor, provided all the immediate successor are red. So they are all in the domain. So this is the construction. So this is the construction that tells you in our paper. And so we indicate the points of the layers with the letter R or S. The letter S means that they are red in the, in the subframe. Then uh, sigma, uh, yes, uh, well, this is, there should be a, a, a sigma here, not a K, K means nothing here. This is a, well, I mean, I have seen slides many times, but some, some, mis, some misprint still in there. So, so you, you have, a, you have a, uh, the letter which indicates R, R or S, which indicates whether they are red or not. Then you, uh, there is a letter which indicates the, the, the anti-chain, uh, this immediate successor, and another letter which indicates the color, okay? Alpha is uh, the immediate successor. Then level zero, we have uh, uh, the, the, it's like in color, but the points uh, may be red or not, but for the same versus they are the same. Level N plus one, then you, or again, you can take R with, uh, we'll take an anti-chain, which intersects level N, and uh, you take an a, a attached to, to a new point, and you take a coloring, a color which is strictly contained in the color of the um, of the intersection of the colors of the elements of alpha, and this is okay. But in addition, you can also have points whose color is the same as the color of the element in a, in this, uh, an intersection of the color of the immediate successor. But in that case, the anti-chain should not be all made by red points. There should be some R there, okay? Then, I mean, uh, then the, the, the guess, the, well, the, the, the point is to prove that this is finite. This is not completely obvious. There is an argument in our, in, in the paper. You, uh, it's, it's a half page, it's not so, well, I mean, it's not trivial, but it's not so difficult. But I mean, the, the construction halts at, after finite and many steps, but, uh, I mean, the number of steps where it starts is much, uh, it's not just the, the, the cardinality of the set of colors because with the cardinality with two phase generators, you stop after seven, 17 levels. So uh, it has nothing to do with the, 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 the well, I mean, it has not a, a very simple relationship to, to, the, to the cardinality of the generators. I mean, the intuition is that whenever you, you make these dangerous uh, points, which uh, repeats the coloring, I mean, they, they, should, they should be a witness point above them, which is built according to the color decreasing point is, because it is not in S. This is the idea why the, 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 the construction stops. And so making some neutral recursion on the R and the S, you will prove the that, uh, the, that, the, that the construction finishes, okay? These are the full details in our paper. I want to say that in the paper, I mean, irreducible models, they are defined, uh, they are characterized using partitions, I mean, correct partition, which is much um, more familiar stuff. But I mean, the characterization and the final construction that I gave in my talk are exactly the same. I mean, they are completely equivalent, but they are obtained in a, in a slightly different way. Okay, so that's that's it. Let me thank you. Okay, thank you very much. <clears throat> thank you very much. So there might be questions.
think they should be. Uh, I, 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 uh, how many sub varieties do you have? Well, I don't know. I mean, uh, we have some kinds, a couple of examples in the in in, in our paper. So, for instance, I mean, uh, uh, one example is uh, whether it, well, I mean, even a ground axon, an interesting ground axon, is to uh, add to to inhibit. To have a zero element and to inhibit a zero to be a cover of nothing except of a zero, for instance. I mean, I don't think that they have been studied very carefully. Of course, I mean, even uh, even for conjunction and implication, you have you have uncountably many. So uh, I said, well, of course, so it will be the same here. But I mean, um, I don't think that there is an extensive study of this. Of this, uh, of, of this variety here. Okay, thank you. Is it is it uh, true that the the growth is exponential? Of of the universal model when you move I, to the I, next I... level. It is yes, I think so, but I mean, I mean, actually, it was Mamuka who made this computation about the the in America. There are some pictures in the paper, but still, I mean, uh, beyond two, it's impossible to to go. And even it would be with two, I mean, uh, it could put the picture only of a couple of levels because I mean, they they. Uh, I mean, the construction is. Well, I mean, it's in a sense, it's quite easy to describe, but to, to come to count, I mean, it's uh, it's it's a hard stop. It's a hard job. I mean, yes. But it is computable. I mean, the the function of the contra model, the size of the contra model. Yeah. Yes. Computable. Yeah. I think so. Yes. <clears throat> Although we, we uh, I must say that we didn't. Uh, well, I mean the. Uh, we didn't uh, consider. I mean, I would like, it would be nice to have some uh, some uh, estimate of the age, for instance, because I mean, for the number of elements, it would be terrible. But for the eight, maybe it is not so hard to to get some estimate about the eight of the model. Okay, that would be a problem to think about. Hmm. Is uh, uh, another question is is there a, a, an appropriate notion of bi simulation for for the, the these um, uh, another, dual yes for, yeah, this for, is another thing that uh, should be thought about I mean uh, of course I mean I think so I think so surely but uh, by simulation and uh, yeah but it still has to to be thought about. I mean, I think that, I mean, in principle, I mean, the way I, I see by simulation, well, you, you can see that at a span. And so since you have a finite duality, you can, you can, under, you can uh, dualize the notion and see what it happens. So basically, uh, so one one way to, to see this, I mean, you, you have two frames here. Could be P and S, and you have Q and T. By simulation, it could be, I mean, you take another frame, F and H, okay? And then you could take a couple of maps here, such that, I mean, uh, they are jointly subjective in a sense. I mean, whatever it means. I mean, it, we know what it means in the duals. I mean, in the duals, it means that I mean, then uh, I mean, for, for the duals, so you have this, this, this thing here, this thing here. Okay. Yeah. H. And then you, you can have a dual, dual, dual ma two maps here, which are jointly monic. And then if, if you if you have a duality, and so 
And so you, you can make some kind of exercise about uh, unraveling a correspondence theory to, to see what it means, I mean, and get the definition, I think. So that's my, what I, I can imagine could be. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Yes, 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 please. Uh, yeah. This is maybe a bit more technical question. Do you have a DPC here, equational definable principle congruences? I, I, I didn't understand because I mean, uh, uh, do we have equation of definable principle congruences? Ah, uh, yes. I mean, the congruences are the same as in the intuitionistic logic. Yes. Yes. I mean, uh, they satisfy this uh, uh, this property here, which is uh, among the properties that I, I put for the general theory of for, of uh, these universal models here. One of the properties implies the ADPC. <clears throat> yes, this property here. This property here implies the ADPC. And actually, this term is, uh, is like in intuitionistic logic, it's just X. Because, uh, I mean, yeah. Uh, so, uh... Uh, yes, I see. Uh, maybe it's it's it's, it's not uh, maybe it's irrelevant. But uh, do we have some kind of embedding from from your? Can we consider uh, the equational theory here as a fragment of something more familiar, like S four, for example? I don't think so. I mean, but I know that there is a paper by Wesney and Guram that made a kind of. A, uh, hierarchy of uh, intuitionistic model logic using both uh, uh, this nuclei and uh, modality, S4 modalities. I mean, Guram, can you, can you say something maybe about your paper? Yeah, actually, you know, already Feitloff and Mendler have a translation into some kind of S4, but with two modalities. So it's two S4 modalities one contained in the other. And then they do some Gödel type of translation into it. So some translations exist, yes. And they uh, are full and faithful, you know. Yes, and I in fact, that's how Feitloff and Mendler de developed their semantics, you know, which is slightly different from ours, you know. Mm -hmm. I remember that I had also, you know what I mean, in, in, at the time of my master thesis, I had a paper with uh, Giancarlo, which was published only in Italian. Which had uh, this uh, this um, local operator over a classical basis, and yes, and it was something like that. I mean, but the paper was published only in Italian in, in uh, about uh, well, I mean, uh, eighty two or eighty three. Uh, well, I mean, with these very early papers, we we didn't care so much about publishing, so so I don't even remember exactly what was there. And another thing I would like to add is that this is also closely related to Dragalin semantics, you know, because uh, yes. in a way you can you can cast the whole Dragalin semantics in the language of nuclear. You know, so there are very close connections, you know, mm. and you can do some translations, you know, that that. Yes, yeah, you have a paper on at AML. It seems to me about that. Uh, yeah. 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 Mm. Thank yes, you. yes, yes. I remember that very well when he introduced that in when teaching his course in intuitionism, mm. he he called it hiding algebras with completion, mm -hmm. because this is this small operator is it's like completion, so, so sort of. Mm. Yes. In my opinion, he was slightly ahead of time because at the time, you know, it didn't have sufficient uh, sufficient impact, I think. But from today's point of view, he actually, his semantics unifies all the existing semantics. You know? Yes, yes, yes. That's true. 
Okay, more, more questions, please, if anyone. Okay, so let's thank the speaker again. Yes.